Okay, Gikuru, you can take over. All right, thank you, Katile. Welcome so much, our mentor. We've been waiting for you, but thank God you're here. So, everyone, today we are going to have our session on the health and well being of a pregnant woman. And our mentor today is Purity Jogona. So, without wasting any further time, let me welcome her so that you can hear from her. Feel free to type any questions that you might have on the chat box and the speaker will respond to them as we go by. Thank you. Welcome, Purity. Hello, Purity, can you hear me? I think we lost her. Uh, I'm not seeing her in the group. I see our mentor is back in. So, Karibu Sana Purity. Purity, you can start over the session. We are ready for you.
Hello everyone, I think our mentor is experiencing some technical issues. Let's kindly be patient with her. Ruti, can you hear me? Atila, you can take us to the next slide. If you're talking, we can't hear you. Can you check your, your audio? It's a bit faint. Hello, Purity, you have not had anything from your side. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, you can hear you now. Loud, loud enough? Yeah, you're loud enough now. Okay, okay. So let's start. Let's go to the next slide. So we're going to look at health assessments during pregnancy and nutrition in pregnancy um, or healthy eating. So the next slide, please. So um, this diagram is going to explain the necessity or the yeah the need for nutrition the need for um 
take, for us to take care of a pregnant woman. So we are starting with a mom. So this is the life of a woman from infancy, a cure for Tumboya Mama, all the way up to adulthood. So nutrition um, or malnutrition or ill health can affect the outcome of a mother, of a woman or a mother or a female all the way from infancy up to adulthood. So if you look at um, if we look at the the slide, the, the diagrams in the next slide, please look at the next slide, go to the next slide. So if we look at the diagram on our left, from infancy, if the child is born with a low birth weight, so let's say in an example, so for example, my mother um, was not, uh, very well taken care of, so she does not have the right nutrition or the right kind of um, or the right kind of health care. So I'm born with low birth weight. So in as a consequence, I'll have inadequate growth and development as a child and be stunted. I'll, I'll have reduced cognitive development, and that inadequate growth and development will be transferred will be transferred all the way up to adulthood and back to my child as an infant. So it's a cycle. The, the, the problem of not having enough, um, the problem of not having good nutrition or malnutrition, and also the problem of not having adequate healthcare, the consequences always go in a circle from generation to generation. So in the right, on the right uh, side, there's a diagram also of if my parent or my mom, my mother was uh, overweight. So we are talking about overnutrition. On the left, we're talking about undernutrition and on the right, we're talking about overnutrition. So if the, my parent is um, obese, let's say obese, the effects of that attract all the way up to my child. And if my child is also uh, malnourished in the, in the sense of, of her nutrition, that is also passed on in that sense. So on this, we're going to look at um, something called um, intergenerational development of disease. So because of because of this uh, phenomenon of the cyclical uh, passing on of, of consequences of ill health or, or malnutrition, you'll find that even diseases, when we when we look at the development of diseases, they, they begin in terms in infancy and they are passed on to the next generation and to the next generation. So if we look at the If we look at the um, yeah, if we look at the diagram on the right, so as an adult, because I have metabolic syndrome, if you look at um, the part of an adult and the arrow pointing to an infant, so the consequences of me having my metabolic syndrome, which an example of that is uh, diabetes, the consequences can also be taken to an infant. So this infant, if that is not rectified, they can also take it back to their infant once they are grown, once that uh, infant grows into a woman and, and gives birth to their child, they'll also pass it on. So um, that's why um, malnutrition and ill health is not, um, is, is, is a problem when it comes to taking care of pregnant women. So for healthcare providers, nurses or doctors, that is something that needs to be that needs to be of um, importance to them when they are thinking about taking care of a, of a pregnant woman of a pregnant woman during ANC clinics. So malnutrition and uh, ill health, whether it's disease, um, adequate healthcare or adequate just support. So let's go to the next slide. 
So during pregnancy, I'm not sure, um, depending on the number of, uh, or let's say in the experience of the participants, I'm sure you've heard of uh, ANC clinics. And ANC clinics are antenatal care clinics that a pregnant woman is supposed to go to during every, let's say every trimester. So it is the goal of the government to make sure that every mom, every mother to is able to go to every clinic. But most mothers are not able to go to their, I wouldn't say they're not able, but yeah, let's just say they're not able to go to, to their clinic until the last trimester. So in this is the required schedule of uh, visit to the clinic, but you'll find that a lot of mothers, a very high percentage of mothers in Kenya, will only go to the clinic at 32 to 40 weeks. And we see that that's the last part. So during, uh, during this clinic, what are we looking at? We are looking at uh, assessing the mother, seeing is she physically okay, is she clinically okay, nutrition assessment to check if she has malnutrition. We're looking at uh, is she prepared for birth, development of a birth plan, and also health and nutrition education. And this, we continue with this, um, this kind of activities throughout, throughout the visit. So during, um, let's say a, a mother, a new mother has come to the clinic on the first day. One, we're looking at uh, the weight, how is her weight, is she underweight? Because um, if she's underweight, that's also a problem for, that it signals a problem for the fetus and also for the mother. Uh, other than the weight, we're looking at, um, other things like, for example, we test the mom to see if she has problems like um, STI or HIV. We also test the mom to look at the blood group. We look at the resistance factor. And those, those are things that we, look, we, do, we are doing on the first visit. So on the second visit, we're also doing the same things that we did, but also now we are doing it in a more detailed manner. And that goes on for the third visit and the fourth visit. So like I said before, most mothers will find that they don't come to the clinic until they're at their last, the 32 to 40 week stage. So I think, um, let's, let me just ask a question. If, since you are, since we are, we are training you to become a health professional in the future, how would you influence mothers to come to the clinic earlier, to be able to, to come for the first, the second, and the third visit. So how would you be able to influence mothers to come for the all the clinics? So that's just a, a question I have posed to the participants. <laughs> Any suggestions? Thank you, Abu Bakar. Uh, Abu Bakar is saying, yeah, self education on the importance of ANC. So, a follow up question, Abu Bakar, where will you, when will you educate, uh, and who are you educating on the importance of ANC? Who are you educating, and when will you do it? Any more suggestions? Any more suggestions? So remember that also. Yes. Yes, thank you, Lydia. That's a very good suggestion. So where will you find this mother? Will you, for example, in the village, you can go to the, the there are no more barazas nowadays. So where would you go? There's churches, yeah? 
Yes, thank you, Josh. Awareness is very important. Yes, and thank you also for pointing out the role of fathers in this process of ANC. Visits are very important. Thank you, Joyce. Yes, yes, yes. Emily, thank you for that. It's a very, it's a very important um, point you brought out about the community health workers or volunteers. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. So remember something. <laughs> yeah. So the best person to to go to this Udaku joints are the community health workers. And like um like Emily said, community health workers are very respected in this in the in the society. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Beryl. So um, remember that another thing that we are looking at during this uh, visit is going, is we're looking at the history of this mother, the history of pregnancies. So when you're looking at the history of pregnancies, the clinical assessment, the nutrition assessment, you're also looking for risks, things that could risk the pregnancy, the, the health of the fetus and the health of the mother. So for example, in the history of the birth, we're looking at the number of children um, the mother has, the number of children the mother has had, the outcome of those pregnancies, the type of birth that, um, the type of birth that the, the mother had. And also we're looking at things like um, how, how did, uh, or let's say history, the history of diseases. For example, if that mom has diseases that um, she had before the pregnancy or that started during the pregnancy. So next slide, please. Thank you all for the suggestions and the responses. Let's go to the next slide, please. So since I'm a nutritionist, this is the area I will focus on most. So nutrition assessment during pregnancy. Um, one of them is uh, anthropometric measures. And what that means is measure, physical measurements, weight, um, height, yeah, things like that. And then um, biological measurements. So um, we're looking at um, blood tests, yeah? So we're looking at urinalysis, things like urinalysis. Um, we're looking at blood tests, for example, for iron, the iron levels. We're looking at things like um, Bressel's factor and the blood group for the mother. Um, uh, Irene, we are just, we are in the introduction. So, well, the clinical assessment, we're looking at um, the history of this mother, any kind of disease in the family or any kind of disease that the parent, the mother has. Um, we're also looking at their physical, um, physical status. Do they look malnourished? Do they look, do, are, are they showing signs of uh, micronutrient deficiencies? Are they showing signs of, are they showing signs of um, any other diseases? And then we're also looking at the dietary history. And when we're looking at the dietary history, we're also going to, when, you, when you're assessing the diet history of a mom, you'll be able to see if there's a risk of, or she has a risk of uh, food insecurity or her food is um, inadequate in terms of the nutrients that it has. Yeah, in terms of the nutrients that it provides. So things like that are what we are looking at. So well, that's the information that you'll get about the mother. So something else that uh, we will be able to to get is um, 
the family history. So while we're looking at the diet history, there's also that um, family history, the things that the mother will tell you about her family that will show you that either the mom is at risk of malnutrition or not. So this includes um, food taboos, things like food taboos in their culture. For example, she's not allowed to eat certain kinds of uh, meat or she's not allowed to eat um, certain kinds of food. So you'll find that her the restrictions placed on her by society or by culture put her at risk of malnutrition or micronutrient um, deficiency. Yes, so during nutrition assessment, I also looking, you'll find that the mom will also tell you about even her financial status. So that way you'll know if she has if she has no job, no stable job, and has more than, let's say, two children, then you know that that's also something that can put her at risk of malnutrition. So social, other social risks that put her at malnutrition other than finance, financial um, uh, status, uh, culture, they also include, um, what else? Yes, social economic status, whether she has a job or not, whether she's employed or not. Yeah, things like that. Whether she's a single parent or she's a widowed um, mother. So yeah, so the kind of information that you collect during assessment will, will inform you whether the mom is at risk of malnutrition, is already uh, malnourished, or if she's um, at risk of other diseases. For example, gestational diabetes or um, hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. Yeah, so let's go to the next slide, please. Why is prenatal care important? The work that nurses, uh, community health workers, and nutritionists and doctors do during prenatal care is important because it prevents uh, preventing um, or reducing mortality of mothers and fetus and infants. We're also able to catch early development of disease. For example, um, gestational diabetes and uh, hypertensive disorders. And the management of these uh, disorders during pregnancy can also prevent development of this disease after pregnancy. So the mom will not be able to um, have these problems even after she gives birth. So also we are able to prevent malnutrition and the consequences of malnutrition on both the mother and the child, and also be able to prevent low fetal birth. Uh, low weight, I mean low weight birth for fetus, for children, for infants, and also preterm birth. Let's next slide, please. So yeah, next slide. Next slide, please. So we are going to talk about um, a healthy. No, let's just go to the pop quiz. So we're going to talk about um, a healthy diet or yeah, a healthy diet in in pregnancy or even for someone who is healthy. So what is a healthy diet? Um, in your in your understanding, what do you think a healthy diet is? Um, that's a question I'm posing to the participants. In your in your understanding, what do you think is a healthy diet? Healthy. 
I think everyone has answered. I can read out some of the some of the responses on the chat box. We have Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr says that the meal that contains all nutrients. We have a diet that contains a balanced a diet that co consists of balanced diet by Esther. Lydia says food that got all the nutrients required by the body. Brenda says that a diet that contains safe food with nutrients in adequate amounts. We also have Ruth that says a healthy diet is one that contains all nutrients. Yeah, we have a lot of responses. Baril says eating food that contains all nutrients required by the body at at a right portion. Okay, so the responses are very are very good. Yeah. Very good, very good, very good, very good. Yes, they are all very, very good, but um, quite inadequate. Please end the polling. So when, when we are um, defining what a balanced diet is, I like that a lot of, of uh, a lot of people have pointed out one part of yeah one part of every one part of every of the right definition so some have talked about the portion some have talked about uh food groups some have talked about food safety yeah some have talked about uh moderation yeah and i i like that so when you're talking about um, when we're talking about uh, a balanced diet, other than safety, other than the right and amount of food groups, we also need mean um, that an individual, or in this case, we're talking about a pregnant mother, is supposed to have food that is one adequate in terms of the amount of um, nutrients or just the amount of food is adequate to satisfy satisfy um, their hunger and also satisfy their nutrient requirements. And also we mean that it is balanced in terms of the different food groups provided, uh, the, the different food groups that are required the food is balanced in terms of there's the right amount of each nutrient, the right amount of each food group in that mother's diet. Something else is variety. So variety in terms of the different food types that we take. So one food, 
one type of food does not only contain one type of nutrient. You'll find that one type of food, for example, in the vegetable food group, you'll find that um, kale and uh, cabbages, yeah, they all contain vitamins and minerals, but you'll find that the, the, the composition is different. So different types of food provide different types of uh, micro nutrients. So something else is moderation in terms of the amount of food or the amount of food from each nutrient that we are getting. So if uh, you're looking at a plate that contains uh, fries and in town, Kenda kwa hoteli, you'll find that a plate that contains uh, fries and uh, what do you eat? Uh, a little bit of salad, of cold slow salad, and a little bit of in case you buy a sausage or a smoky or a chicken. So you'll find that the amount of um, food group that provides carbohydrates in that case is a lot compared to the others. So something else is a nutrient density. So nutrient density, we mean that there's, there are foods, there are foods that provide uh, more than, more uh, nutrients in very small quantities as compared to others. So for example, um, a potato, a sweet, no, let's say an Irish potato. So if we, if we make uh, that potato, if we boil that potato and just uh, serve it like that, the amount of nutrients is, uh, is just, not very adequate for that mother. But if we turn that type of food into, let's say, mokimo, one, we've increased the nutrient density of that food. So if another example is if we boil an egg. So if you boil an egg, yes, it's a very nutritious uh, type of food, and that's okay. But if we either, if we fry it or scramble, or if we make it into an omelet, the other ingredients that you're adding are also making it more nutrient dense. That's what I mean by nutrient density. So something else is caloric adequacy. So the food that you're giving the mom must be adequate in terms of the amount of calories that it provides. So some foods, for example, if the mom is eating fries and a soda, that food has a lot more calories than the mom uh, requires. But if we restrict the mom, mom uh, you, you should only eat salads. You don't want to add a lot of weight. You find that the amount of calories that she is getting is very little. So calories re refer to, the, we, we're trying to give the mom the right amount of energy. So next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So, um, the number of changes, there are different types of changes that occur in a mom's body during, during um, pregnancy. So her body, her body changes, the body of the fetus also changes. And each change places a different demand for the mom to provide in terms of uh, nutrients. So let's go to the next slide, please. So the changes during in a fetus, one day it includes physical growth. So the child, the baby, or the, let's say the fetus is growing physically developing fingernails, fingers, toes, uh, limbs, um, cognitive development, the brain is developing uh, both physically and its function in terms of function. So also development of immune factors uh, such as blood and other immune factors in, in, in the blood. Uh, organ development and the function of those organs and the organ systems. 
And in the mother, we have um, organ development such as uh, placenta, more breast tissue, and also um, things like, um, now we've talked about the placenta, that placenta and also the systems that run the placenta. So another thing is the nourishment of the fetus from the mother's own stall, own nutrient stall. So these are some of the changes, just some of the changes that occur during pregnancy. There are a lot more changes, and these are just some of them. And these changes um, place different demands on, on the type, on nutrient requirements. So for example, for cognitive development, um, there's a photo that I'm going to, to send. So when you look at um, organ development, so in the fetus, cognitive development at the early, early weeks, in the first trimester, you'll find that the neural tube is developing. So if you find that the mom does not have, has the, um, what's it called? Um, folate deficiency. When the mom has folate deficiency, you'll find that the child will have neural tube defects. And some of these neural tube defects include spinal bifida and other types of neural tube defects. So you'll also find that um, nourishment from the of of the fetus or nourishment of or development of the fetus it involves nutrients other than um the health of the mother we're also going to look at things um that affect the development this development that we are talking about so let's go to the next slide please Okay, so one of the nutrients that affects the development of the development of the, the different types of um, changes that occur in either the fetus or the mother that we've talked about in the previous slide. Um, Irene uh, will answer the questions at the end. So um, one of them is iron. We'll only talk about two because of time, two on the slides, but I'll mention the rest. One of them is iron. There are two main forms of iron that are provided in food, heme and non-heme iron. So you'll find that heme iron is, is found in animal sources and is more available, more bioavailable in the body. So it's better absorbed than the non-heme iron that is found in plant, plant uh, sources. So another uh, problem that we might, a mother might encounter when, when she has no access to the heme iron, if she's a vegetarian or she's because of um, cultural, um, cultural factors, she's only, she's restricted to only plant uh, sources of iron, you'll find that, uh, there are other factors that influence the availability of iron from plant sources. So there, there are um, inhibitors found in plant, uh, found in found in plant sources that affect whether the mom will um, be able to absorb iron from her food. So some of them include phytates. Some of them include. Um, which are which are found in still the same food. So for example, if you just give me a minute. So um Katile, please uh, show the photo I've just sent you. So I've just sent you.
Yes, yes. Those are also some of the inhibitors, tannins. So I'm waiting for Katile to to share the photo I've just sent. I sent it on WhatsApp. Hello, Katile or Gikuru, please. Either the photo or the document that I had sent. Katile, can you share? So um, let's finish up with uh... yeah. So in this case, if um, the mom has a folate deficiency, you'll find that the it affects the development of the neural tube. So that the child develops defects such as spina bifida. It also affects the mom in the sense that the child, uh, in the sense that um, she can get anemia, and also the baby will be born with um, low birth weight. So just let's go back now to where we were. Um, let's go back to the presentation. Is it pretty jamming to not speak as Oh. No, we were on iron. 
Yes. So, um, so, um, other than fight it, you'll find that, um, another source of um, inhibitors or another type of inhibitors is tannins. So tannins are found in um, the same foods that provide, so it's, um, it's ironical <laughs> in the sense that the same, um, the same foods that provide iron are the same foods that have factors that inhibit its absorption. So, one of the questions that are going to be sent are going to cover the ion inhibitors. So, um, for example, in the case of the question that Emily has sent, uh, tannins and caffeine, you'll find that when you're the, the, the when you're taking um, lunch or when you're taking supper, just immediately after, you'll find that you want to, or normal Kenyans will want to take tea. And then you all, because of the, so the um, factors such as tannins in the tea, you'll find that they bind iron. And this is the same for a lot, other, a lot of other micronutrients such as calcium but we'll get to that. So let's go to vitamin A. So vitamin A, also the sources of this um, Nutrients, I've seen someone has asked a question. That's one of the questions that are going to be sent. So um, vitamin A is uh, one of the many vitamins that are required by the mom. But this is one of um, importance because um, its effects are very common in a lot of mothers, both and also in children, in infants. So you'll find that during... Um, during pregnancy, at the last semester, at the last trimester, there's a very high demand for for vitamin A, and yeah, and during the early stages of pregnancy, during the early stages of pregnancy, you find that it has um, teratogenic effects to the infant, but in the last uh, trimesters is when we, we can give um, the mom either a supplement. Yeah, so one of the, one of the questions that I'm going to ask is, uh, is, it, is it recommended to give a mother um, a multi, a supplement, a multi-nutrient supplement. Is it recommended to give a mother a multi-nutrient supplement during pregnancy? Um, has anyone had the question? Yes, so yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Brenda. So that's why I'm asking, is it recommended to give a multinutrient supplement? in pregnancy? Yes, so thank you for the ones that have answered. 
it's not recommended to give a multi-nutrient supplement. Yes, because some of the nutrients have teratogenic effects. But, <laughs> yes, thank you, Joyce. But there are also nutrients that are, cannot be cannot be sufficiently provided for in the diet. So for example, um, iron, folate, that's why we have um, the IFAS. It's commonly known as IFAS, supplements for pregnant mothers, but no multinutrient uh, supplements during pregnancy. So next slide, please. So yeah, that's the end of our, of our presentation, but other nutrients that we have not um, talked about in the presentation include uh, folates that we've discussed in, in very um, limited uh, details, but it is very critical all the way from conception throughout the trimester throughout the trimesters another um, nutrient that is um, important for pregnant mothers iodine calcium vitamin d so iodine um, deficiency in a pregnant mother can lead to uh, poor motor development for the child for the in for the fetus or poor cognitive development for the fetus, risk of miscarriage or uh, fetal growth um, restriction. And for calcium, you'll find that a mom who's a pregnant mother who has a calcium deficiency has um, a higher risk of getting hypertensive disorders, for example, amperin clumps, yeah. And also vitamin D is very important. For a pregnant mother, you'll find that a pregnant mother who's also deficient in vitamin D has um, a higher risk of developing um, hypertensive disorders, um, having preterm birth or a low birth weight um, infant. So vitamin D, uh, we can get it from uh, a number of sources, including the sun, yeah? Just going outside then, sun basking kidogo. So I'll send um, a few questions which include the um, sources of these nutrients. Yeah, and uh, some of the some of the effects of deficiencies that we have covered. So thank you, thank you all. We're going to answer a few of the questions. Thank you so much, Priti. Kindly participant, if anyone has a question, kindly post on the chat box or you can maybe unmute and ask the question. Priti, I'm not sure if you answered the question that was posted about what normally causes the swollen limb and feet of the mother during pregnancy and how it can be prevented. So you'll find that. Uh... One of the reasons is the uh, hypertensive disorders. And during the ANC clinic from the first visit to, especially from the first visit, the mom, we can, you can be able, as a, as a healthcare professional, you can be able to notice some of these things early on. Yeah. Um, I will leave the, the treatment of those hypertensive disorders to the next to yeah the next uh, speaker who's more more conversant with the treatment yeah okay I see another question what happens to those who can't afford to take the required nutrients during pregnancy especially those people living in rural rural areas. So um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the IFAS, iron and folic acid um, supplementation, and it's a very 
um, public campaign. So you'll find that it is offered either free in a lot of public, um, yeah, a lot of public um, facilities or at a very subsidized price. Yeah, in all, all, all facilities, even in the rural areas. Okay, I, I see Agatha has also responded. She's saying during pregnancy, the extra fluid on the body and the pressure of the growing uterus can cause swelling or edema in the ankles and feet. The swelling tends to get worse as a woman due to the due date nears, particularly near the end of the day and during the hotter weather. It can also be due to pre-eclampsia. So why do oh, yeah I think this VG says why do people have stretch marks when pregnant? So about uh, Agatha's uh, response, yeah, it's true, but any kind of swelling is is not um, is a sign of uh, is a sign that we need to take care of this mother more more urgently, yeah, let me say more urgently, because especially if the swelling goes uh, beyond the feet, including the face, now that's, that's, um, that's a dangerous sign. So it's mostly, not all mothers will have that kind of swelling, but those who do will, will, will always have something to do with the hypertensive disorders, yeah. Why do people have stretch marks when pregnant? <laughs> well, it's because the skin stretches to its limit. <laughs> yeah, but you'll find that some don't. Yeah, but um, some will not have them, but some do. And some do to a very um, larger extent than others. Some will have very small stretch marks that go away, and others will have some that stay very long. Yeah. There another question. Yes, Agatha is very right. Yeah, I don't see any further questions. Is there anyone who would like to ask our mentor any question? So um, there's a document that will be sent by by um, Katile that's like a more Kenya because the questions are just what the document says. So please read. Okay, thank you. Since I don't see any further questions, also in Facebook, we don't have any questions. I would wish to thank you so much for, for saving some time to come and mentor us about the health and well-being of the pregnant women. Thank you, our participants, for being very patient with us. I believe in the beginning we had some technical issues, but you're so patient with us. So thank you so much. I hope you have all filled in the the attendance list that I sent earlier. Yeah, thank you so much. I don't know if Katile has something to tell us before we can end our session. Uh, for me, I enjoyed the session. I don't have much to say. Thank you so much, our speaker, and thank you so much, our moderator. Yeah. So um, I, I see one last question by Esther. Are there any restrictions? No, there are no, there are no restrictions for pregnant mothers, but you'll find that some mothers develop uh, gestational diabetes during pregnancy. So in that case, the type of fruit or the amount of fruits that they take matter yeah, in order to control their sugars. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Purity. Thank you for spending time. Have, you are very knowledgeable about this nutrition thing. Thank you so much. So you can feel free to leave the session. 
and thank you for your participation. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. You'll see you next time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.